Good evening from Boston College. Uh, I'm Bert Howell, and I'm the Executive Director of Intersections. I welcome you to the show at six, BC and the Common Good. The show at six features friends and members of the BC community discussing a range of issues affecting our world today, all revolving around the theme of the common good. Topics include how the BC community is responding to the effects of COVID-19, to the enduring challenges of the marginalized, to our own resiliency and solidarity, and to the upbuilding of human dignity throughout the world. The show is based on the central insight of the common good. That is, that the resources that humanity has and needs must be shared equitably. For instance, today each of us is called to promote the common good by social distancing, by wearing masks, by washing our hands. These practices, like other forms of solidarity, are not only for our own good, but for the common good. In many of the previous segments, we've heard repeatedly about the disparities in healthcare, employment, and education that lead African Americans to be much more at risk to the pandemic. At the same time, the brutal killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd highlight all the more how white privilege, anti-blackness, and other forms of racism endanger the lives of our brothers and sisters. We are, at VC, a Jesuit Catholic school committed to being men and women for others. We know that through solidarity and a commitment to the common good, we can beat the virus of COVID-19. But we must be no less committed to defeating the virus of racism that destroys the lives of so many. At 640, my co-host and I will ask our guests questions from the audience. Members of the audience can pose a question before 640 p.m. via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Let me repeat that. Members of the audience can pose a question before 640 p.m. via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. They should identify themselves by their name and relationship to BC. I'm delighted to co-host this segment tonight uh, with Regine Michelle Jean Charles. She is an associate professor of Romance Languages and Literatures and African and African Diaspora Studies at Boston College. She is the author of Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation in the Francophone Imaginary. Her latest book on contemporary Haitian literature is under contract with the University of Virginia Press. She is also a board member of A Long Walk Home Incorporated. Regine? Thank you so much, Bert, for that introduction and a warm welcome um, to our guests. We're so excited to have this conversation and to begin this conversation with you. Um, I'm a little scared of the timing, though, I have to say, because now we only have 35 minutes to talk to you, not an hour. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, our guests, again, are uh, Linda Dorsina Forey and Bill Forey. Um, the title of this session is Race and Boston, the Story of Dorchester. And my first question is actually about this title, right? So I always tell my students that when we think about race, we cannot think about race alone, that we have to think intersectionally. And we know that intersectionality is basically a lens, right? And for anyone who doesn't know that's listening, it's a lens for seeing how inequalities often operate together and they exacerbate each other. So we're not just thinking about race, we're thinking about race plus times class, times gender, times sexuality, um, times sometimes immigrant status. Um, and so I, my question for our, our, our wonderful guest is this, how do we, uh, what do race and Boston mean together in the specific context of Dorchester? What do they mean for you personally in your lives, but also for you in terms of your work? Linda? You want to take that one first? Go ahead. Oh, you're going to have it. honey. Okay. Oh, well, first, go ahead. Yep. Well, thank you so okay. much. Well, first. Me. I think I'll jump in. Okay. Um, Linda and I decided we it would probably be best if we uh, uh, did this from frozen. several locations and uh, reduce the risk of being interrupted by one or more of our four children. Uh, we live together in Dorchester, of course, in Lower Mills, and I'm in at my office in Dorchester. Um, on Columbia Point. So I, obviously for us having, uh, we both were born and raised in Dorchester. We lived there for all of our 40 something years. I'm not gonna reveal the full number. Um, I think for both of us, we've experienced uh, the neighborhood um, obviously as people growing up here and, and race has always been a part of our, our awareness and our upbringing. Um, you know, we, we lived through we, our formative years in the 1970s and 80s as, um, as students and, and adolescent and then teenagers. 
um, race was very much a part of our, our, our daily life and, and how ethnic groups sometimes um, clashed and sometimes gelled and, and got to know each other and, and formed uh, friendships that maybe defied what um, conventional wisdom about how Boston was supposed to work and parochialism and the nature of, of uh, enclaves, uh, competing interests. In our experience, and I think we've seen both sides of that, we've seen all sides of that because it is a complex organism. You're talking about a community, a neighborhood of um, more than 120,000 people. It comprises about 20% of the city of Boston, uh, roughly, maybe a little bit less. Um, but yet it's the, certainly the most diverse community in the city when it's taken. As, we have sections, we have, you know, uh, in the old days we had parishes or, or enclaves that were, were, were more homogeneous than others. But today's Dorchester is a very mixed um, community for the most part. There are still a couple of precincts here and there that are, that are uh, heavily uh, white Irish or, or, or predominantly uh, Afro-Caribbean or, or whatever. But much of our community now is mixed income, mixed um, ethnic groups and a multicultural community, which, which has happened over three or four decades of our lifetime. We've seen that happen. Um, and in that, that context, I think Dorchester, it's certainly far from perfect. And in this conversation, I'm never going to frame it that way. This is a, uh, there are tensions here, just like there are all over this country right now. We have, uh, we have difficult conversations with neighbors that there are people on all sides at the moment. Um, but this is a place where, especially in the Boston context, there is a multicultural column of people and we're part of that. We're our family and, and we're not alone by far. There are so many yeah. that are multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, um, mixed blended families. Um, and that's a big part of what our city is becoming now. We also have so many new people who've arrived either as immigrants or as migrants from other parts of, uh, of Massachusetts and, and the U.S. and, of course, the world. So it's a, it's a complicated and magnific magnificent stew of people. Uh, and out of it, I think, comes some, some promise. There's certainly difficulties, but some promise for um, confronting and moving forward through what is now you know, certainly a, a national crisis. Thank you so much. Do you want to add to that, Linda? I know. Okay, Bill kind of <laughs> said it all. No, um, first, we're just happy to really be here with all of you. I'll just say, no, I totally echo Bill, right? I mean, Dorchester is a great community in terms of the diversity and culturally, ethnically, the languages that are spoken here, you know, but with any community, right, there's always issues. I would say, as you think of race in Boston, um, I would say that Boston gets a bad rap, right? Yes, we've come a long way. We still have more, a lot more ways to go but in our commonwealth there are 351 cities and towns mm -hmm. and i think a lot of times you know when you think of race and, and and automatically people say boston but there's a lot of education that has to happen in these communities you know when the incident happened at fenway park and someone you know yelled the profanity at the player you know um i worked with the Red Sox and Sam Kennedy and the team to come up with, take the lead. But that person was not from Boston, right? They were from one of our other cities and towns in the Commonwealth that came to a game and, and let out a bomb. And so I think it's really important as we have this conversation is also how do we play in the spaces where you all live and when you go back home into the communities to really have that conversation as well. That's, that's, that is so important. You know, I live in the town of Milton, as you both know, and mm -hmm. right now we are in this kind of battle for anti-racist education after some things that have happened in the town. So I really do appreciate that point, that it's yeah. all of these 300, right? It's all of these 351 cities and towns that you mentioned. We appreciate you, uh, Professor Jean. I know. Your, uh, <laughs> your, your column that was published uh, this week in the Boston Globe on that topic, yeah. Milton, uh, uh, Linda, in her role as a state representative, uh, represented Milton, and uh, Milton has also come a long way. And I yeah. think, you know, has has sincerely and genuinely uh, formed uh, organizations that seek to bring people together. Um, and and yet, um, to your point, to your column this week, uh, there there are certainly challenges that um, that you're still facing, and you know, and we all are. So, but uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice. I have another question. Bert, is it your turn or is it, I keep going. 
Oh, Good. please. Yes. Okay. So my next question, I'm actually going to skip um, my question about culture, but to get to this question about history, History, right, which we talked about before. So we're, we're hearing now so often, and it's all over the media, that we're in a time of, of a moment of national reckoning, right, with racism in this country and the need for racial justice. But of course, those of us committed to thinking about this and um, have lived these topics um, and who are committed to anti-racist education, we know that this has been going on for a long time. And I'm interested in you two, um, in terms of your story, particularly how it relates to your history as Boston College students and the activism that you did on campus. I, I'm wondering how you think about the current moment that we're in in relation to this kind of longer struggle that we've been in. And that I think for you, for all the students who are listening, is also something that was really important to you when you were college students, however many years ago. <laughs> uh, we say our age. I'm proud. I'm proud. <laughs> That's what I say. Be proud. <laughs> But you're both class, uh, we, were you in the same, was it the same class? No, not the no. same class. I was 95. 95, yeah. okay. Yeah. 96, okay. Class yeah, of 95 90. and class of 96, 96, right. And so again, you know, in African and in African, African diaspora studies, the program that I'm in, we just became a major, right? And so I know that when you look at, we did this 50 years of ADS and we looked at the history of blacks, um, of black students at Boston College, mm -hmm. but also activism around um, combating anti-blackness. So I'd love to hear how the two of you situate yourselves in relation to that longer history. Yeah. Linda, um, we, we met, we actually, we knew each other sort of before college, like we knew of each other. We hadn't met. Uh, I was, a, when I was a sophomore and Linda was a freshman, the first time we met, I'll never forget, was at an NAACP chapter. Meeting, yeah. At, um, I think it was in. I love Boston. it. Um, and, uh, and then we, we became friends through, through our, you know, various activism and uh, Linda was very active with the Black Student Forum and with, uh, with the HANA groups, I, I was as well, and we both um, got involved in undergraduate government campaigns. Uh, Linda's brother My was brother, yeah. president. Um, I was his campaign manager. It was the first ticket uh, that won at BC, which, in, in which both um, the president and VP were, were, were people of color. His running Cecilia man. Gutierrez, who was Dominican American, yeah. So, and it was actually, that, that was on the front page of the Boston Globe when they won. Yeah. It was a big deal at the time. And um, we were both Linda and I were active in, in that uh, in the in the cabinet the campaign. Yeah, did, we you know did our share of activism together. We actually hosted a uh, when uh, Boston College was going to give a um, uh, an award to Margaret Thatcher, the That's former right. of um, uh, obviously of the UK. We we, uh, we we held a forum because it was controversial in the Irish American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we, uh, we held a forum that uh, you organized, but so our activism really became uh, centered on the, the year after Linda's brother was president there, um, there was really kind of a backlash to him, not unlike mm -hmm. maybe the backlash that we saw here in 2016. Um, the President Barack Obama, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Some of the tenor and tone of the campaign that followed that next cycle was mm -hmm. the college Republican saying, it's time to bring uh, student government back to the students who actually pay to go here. Yeah. Uh, it set off a, a, a chain of activism on the campus, which was really um, unlike anything we'd seen before as students mm -hmm. in, in my senior year. And there were, there were uh, rallies and protests, um, uh, sit-ins, and actually uh, a, a group of uh, black students on campus formed into what, what was called FIST. And yeah. it was modeled really Families on and struggle together. I see Juan Concepcion is on the line and watching Juan. <laughs> Juan. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Linda, talk about what that was like. No, yeah. So I'll just say it, it was quite amazing, right? Because you had FIST, but then you also had Diverse. And it was two um, various organizations, but that was in the struggle and in the protest of mm -hmm. saying, you know, how is it that we could get more students as we have Boston College, Boston, right? How can we get more students here that are from the city of Boston? How can we look at more diverse faculty, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be here on campus? And so it was really quite an interesting um, dynamic, right? Because there was signs went up, sheets went up in the Dust Bowl, and it was really an opportunity um, for people to be able to mobilize, but more importantly, college students. And that was, that's what we're seeing around the country, right? You're seeing young people. You know, the, the person who filmed that video of eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd's murder, yep. yes, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. 
And she held that camera with a steady, steady hand. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're going to pepper spray you. And she stood there. I mean, this is the activism that we have in our young people. And this yeah. is what was happening on the BC campus at that time when we were there. Go ahead, Bill. And it was also an education for us on how, absolutely, know, how there's so many different forms of protest and, uh, and advocacy. And the group that I was involved with was more, uh, it was called Diverse. It was a multicultural group. It had white, white kids like me who were mm -hmm. involved. And, um, and then FIST was mainly or, or pretty much exclusively black and Latina um, and was, was a little bit more, uh, it had the administration a little bit more concern, let me put it that way. They would interrupt uh, events and, and basketball games and, and the kind of activism they did made it possible for uh, for diverse, which I was a part of, to actually meet with administrators because they were kind of afraid of meeting with FIST. They <laughs> meet with the, the, the multicultural group. Um, and, you know, some of the issues that we wanted to bring to the fore was, were then heard. I will say they weren't really necessarily met because they knew they could wait us out a That's year or two to be off campus again and uh, alumni. But, yeah, they were uh, seniors. It was like, peace. <laughs> Go no. ahead, sorry. But it, it was a lesson for us, I think, in, in how important it is to have this, um, you know, um, this different different layers of, of approach and uh, and styles to to bringing activism to, to, to bear on issues like that. And we were really concerned. I know Linda and I were about making sure more kids from Dorchester um, <laughs> that looked like Linda and looked like me, people mm -hmm. from the city. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt strongly that there weren't enough um, Bostonians uh, from city neighborhoods like Dorchester going there. That, that was the big issue we were pushing for. Yeah, yep. thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to Bert, but I just want to say quickly, thank you for mentioning Darnell Frazier. Um, I teach a class with Sean McGuffey, who's a sociologist for the core. So if there are any okay. fresh, first year students, you can sign up, um, called where hashtag Black Lives Matter meets hashtag Me Too. And when I saw that video of Darnell Frazier, I saw so many of my students, my BC okay. students who are so activists, who are so aware, who are, you know, what Elizabeth Alexander calls the Trayvon generation, right? Mm -hmm. Because the senior class that just graduated Ferguson was when they were freshmen, right? And so I really appreciate you bringing that up. And also, Bill, what you're what you're saying, you know, the both and, right? We need the people that are going to be like, burn it all down. And we also need the people that are going to be like, okay, sit and negotiate and talk to the president and talk to the, the VP of Student Affairs, et cetera, et cetera. We need both and. Go ahead, Bert. Both of you have been um, advocates throughout your life uh, after BC. Uh, you've been uh, public servants. Uh, people who have thought about the common good, people who have actively uh, strived to try to reach it. Uh, you've worked in media, in government, in business, all sorts of institutions. And Linda, I'm, I'm going to address this question to you because um, you mentioned young people and, and how important they are right now in what's happening in our world. Um, but one thing I've noticed among young people and, and quite honestly, a lot of older people too, is a loss of trust in institution a sense that maybe our institutions can't really rise to the occasion. Um, I want to ask you as somebody who's dedicated your life in many ways to a variety of institutions, um, do you have faith uh, that institutions can do what is necessary uh, to really challenge the anti-black violence, the systematic racism that's plaguing our country and that has plagued our country since the very beginning? How do, how do you think about uh, that, that, that lack of trust and how do you, how do you find faith if you, if you do find faith? Yeah. Thank you, Bert. Great question. I'm going to say I do have, I, I, I have hope, right? And it's really interesting because I do think with all the murders that have happened, and there's been so many from DJ Henry, who's from Massachusetts, right, to Tamir, it's so many. But this moment has really shifted. And so for me, I have faith that with all the folks that are hitting the streets, with all the work that is happening behind the scenes, with all these corporations and municipalities and even government, when you look at Congress, right, in terms of legislation they've just passed around police reform, around eliminating sh chokeholds around the country, around diving deep in, I have faith and hope that this time it's going to be different. But we can't let our feet off the gas. You can't. Okay. Or else it, we will forget and if we will go back. And so it's what are the systematic changes that we're going to put in place because this is 400 years of inequality. Okay? The Color of Law, amazing book. The Color of Law, um, 
talks about, you know, everyone talks about redlining, right? Oh, it's redlining. Yes, redlining was a big part of it, but it's like blaming the banks, right? So when you talk about redlining, you think of the banks who didn't lend to people of color, didn't allow people to get a mortgage to buy a home and so forth. However, it was our federal government in statute that had laws in the books from housing and urban development from HUD that if, I'm a, if you're a white developer and you wanted to develop an enclave of suburban homes, single family homes for the black veterans that came back from war and you wanted black and brown people to be together, the federal government said no. So as a developer, I'd go to the bank. They'd say, okay, great, we'll do this for you. But they had to get approval from HUD, right? So it's all these systems. It's how do we break away, peel back the onion and dig deep. And it's going to be work, but we have to be in it together. We have to be cis, literally, it is like just a surgeon, right? With a knife and cutting through until we get to the core. Um, but I do have hope. I think that this is a different day and a different time, how people are mobilizing, how it's black, it's brown, it's Latinx, it's Asian, it's white. And for us, really, I go back to empathy. Empathy. We have to see ourselves in each other. Yeah. I need people to see my four children yeah. as if they were their children. That's what we need. And that's how we're going to be able to really start changing um, the systems to allow real opportunities for people. I'm glad, Linda, I'm glad that you brought up that uh, the government's role, obviously, <laughs> And, and when we talk about government back then and today in, in, in the decisions that are made, ultimately it comes back to us, to the electorate. And a lot of times when we talk about Boston, we obviously deal with, with desegregation era busing, um, and it still uh, has this great specter in this town and in Dorchester in particular. And one of, the, one of the other remnants of that era and of kind of Jim Crow era Boston mm -hmm. uh, has lingered in, into into modern day, which is the division of Dorchester into North and South, which was city hall mechanism. It's frankly to, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a close cousin of Redline. It was a yeah. way to, uh, to steer people, residents, oh, blacks live in the North, whites yeah. live in the South. Who knows where the Asians go? I mean, it was a ridiculous premise, but it, it was, was cold. It was cold words, but go ahead. But Bill oh. blew it up in the paper. Good job, honey. Oh, we, we, <laughs> you went in used to use that terminology we challenge it and in, in 2014 in the most recent mayoral contested big field election we posed that to all the candidates and said will you dismantle this last one of the last vestiges of Jim Crow institute mm. racism within city government and um, to Mayor Walsh's credit uh, he's from Dorchester he's aware of the roots of that issue he's uh, he's he started he mainly gotten rid of it in his administration mm -hmm. but I just say that to point out these things go back years and years, but they're still here. They're still yeah. in some form. They're still even subliminally part of people's imagination and how they, they think of the place. And we've part of our careers, Linda and I both has been to try to uh, try to challenge that at least, mm -hmm. if not mm -hmm. uh, uproot it. In many ways, you, you, you sit in, in, in positions of, um, of power to be able to challenge that. And Bill is you as the editor of the Dorchester Reporter. Uh, be, uh, being a voice that, that many people listen to, and Linda uh, having a, an illustrious over 20 year career in government and now working in the private se sector in, in corporate world. Uh, when you were a state senator, when you were a state representative, I think um, in many ways people turn to you and, and to your husband to, to listen to you know, what, what was needed in these situations. Yeah, yeah no, thank you, Bert. No, absolutely. So my next question um, is about um, culture. So we, you all talked about how you recently, in our conversation earlier, you told us that you recently led a discussion group um, of Irish Americans, right? The Irish American Association. Um, and of course, I, you know, as a person of Haitian descent, and Linda, that's how we know how I've known you, right? right? And our families have known each other, <laughs> um, and how our families have known each other. And you know, in in AADS, we had the black in Boston conference and the theme was actually um, the many kind of layers of blackness in Boston. And so I want to ask you both a question about cultural specificity, um, again, both in your personal lives and in your work and how that applies as we think about racial injustice, as we think about many of these topics. And, you know, selfishly, I always love hearing your insight as parents um, as well. Well, I think we, uh, you're, you're, you come from, um, from a 
one of the great founding uh, Boston, uh, Boston Asian families and uh, an illustrious family yourself. Um, yeah. We've always been admirers of you and and, uh, and your siblings and your dad and your mom. Um, so, you know, obviously we we both, um, Linda's family emigrated from from Haiti in the 1960s and, and just just like so many Irish and, and other ethnic uh, folks who came here, um, settled in Dorchester, bought a Victorian home in House, near yeah. corner and, and, and raised their children there, but also brought in uh, brothers and sisters and, and cousins and, and help them get their foothold here. And I think part of what people, especially in places like Dorchester, see just out, you know, just naturally is that kinship between these immigrant experiences mm -hmm. that, that you see and, and it's, it's impossible to, to ignore uh, or, or to dismiss. There's, there's so much commonality there. So that intersection for us, I think, was a, is, a, is a unifier. And it was when, when Linda and I started dating and we, and, you know, I, I, had known Haitian, I had had very close friendship with Haitian people before I ever yeah. met Linda, but, and, and, and that's part of why we, I think, just naturally came together. A place like Dorchester makes that happen because it's just a, more of a natural upbringing like that. Um, but, but then to, to your point, you know, the, the Irish community, obviously here in Boston, much, much bigger, much, uh, much more rooted through, and, and unfortunately has a history of discrimination against blacks. Irish were discriminated against themselves, clearly through, 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 through the 19th century, started attached, uh, became, became white, and, um, were, and have entered into uh, kind, of a, kind of a contract uh, to uh, and unfortunately discriminate against blacks. Many, many Irish surnames are the ones who are, are constantly uh, sending me hate letters and stuff. It, it, it's unfortunate because there are so many Irish Americans here who, who are like me and, and, and see that, uh, that history for what it is. So we did lead a discussion last Friday. And they, and they go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. And they don't also don't know the history, right? Yeah. So in 1880, when the Irish came here, there were signs: no dogs in, in, in you know, in the park, no Irish, right? No dogs, no Irish. Mm. No Irish need apply. So it's important for folks to remember the history of their great great grandparents and the experience that they went through. Again, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Sorry, hon, go ahead. With well, the, Irish panel. That part of, the reason we had that conversation was we, we felt there was a bit of a void happening. And yes. Irish America needed to get plugged into what's going on with Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. in a constructive way. And, and, and we have great allies here in the Irish community, people like Ronnie Millar at, yeah. Miller at, uh, at the Rion Immigration Center, formerly the Irish Immigration Center, the Irish uh, Network Boston, uh, people who are just naturally have an affinity uh, to be supportive. And, and we didn't want those voices being forgotten. We need That's to right. kind of coalesce around that. So uh, it was great. We had um, um, DA Rachel Rollins, Rollins. Who is, is both black and Irish, yeah. like our kids. And uh, she brings a terrific perspective to a conversation like this. Um, and uh, together with Linda and we had other guests on. So it was a productive conversation. It really was. Bill, I want to ask you another question about the, the, the newspaper that you run. Um, whenever I read uh, the national media, I get a really one-dimensional view of Dorchester. Um, it, and I think it's a distorted picture. It's one that seems to obsessively focus on crime and criminals. But when I read the Dorchester Reporter, I get a depth and a fullness that I don't find in other places. Yes, there are people who struggle, but there are many people in Dorchester who are flourishing. Um, and there are many leaders uh, that are coming out of this part of Boston. Um, why does the reporter get this story right? Especially when you don't have necessarily the resources or the staff of some of the bigger, bigger outlets. Oh, Bert, you're very kind. I, I think uh, we try to get it right. I, I, a lot of times we don't. I mean, part of, part of what we do, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the origin story of the reporter is my parents started the paper in the 1980s. Uh, really, you know, as a business, my, my dad uh, was laid off from his job and he had been a columnist at a different paper um, and, and decided this was his passion along with my mom and, and they gave me that opportunity. Um, it's a privilege. But what I will say is that uh, their, their notion was, you know, they wanted to tell the stories that weren't being told in the Globe or other outlets. Um, they, they wanted to bring to, to bear, you know, uh, from folks who actually live in the neighborhood and, and have a perspective that's different. So we try to make, make that happen. And, and the, real, um, the real kernel of, of success behind what we've done is, is my dad and his vision, along with my mom who passed away in 2004. 
but um, but having just the consistency of doing this for almost 40 years now, week in, week out, if you focus on a place as we do on, on Dorchester in particular, you come to know it, you know the people, you have good sources, and then you just try to hire the best people to make uh, the operation and work well. And we're very lucky to be here in, in Boston with great universities. Boston College has been an important pipeline of talent for us. Other universities have as well. So we're just very fortunate in that respect. But I, I do appreciate your, your words. I know. It's great you said that, Bert. I'm just going to pump you up a little bit. But I, you know, in terms of the pipeline is critical. And I have to say the work that they've done over the years, in particular, Bill, um, to really cultivate this new crop of reporters and journalists. And they come to the reporter. They learn so much. They're on the ground. They're in the communities, in the neighborhoods, understanding and learning and, and really having that lens of, of really trying to report um, what's in the best interest. But also they, they move on, right? But it's really, Bill has done a great job in terms of cultivating um, a lot of people who were at the reporter have now gone on to like all these different um, news outlets and television. So it's pretty cool. That's great. Um, so Linda. We, uh, we talked about, <laughs> we talked about this a little bit the other day, but, um, your there's so many, you know, when you left public office, you said that it was not forever and we all wait for the day that you might come back. Um, but there's so many, you know, the, um, the women of color that are currently in leadership in Boston, in this area, they mention you as a mentor and as someone that you know, an inspiration. And so I wanted you to talk, because I do think, again, as a feminist and an intersectional feminist, so often in this national reckoning about race, what gets lost is the voices of women, right? And how Black women specifically are affected by these issues. And so I would love for you to talk about, again, what has this question of racial justice looked like for you um, in relation to your, your work in the public sector and the private sector, specifically given your intersectional identities as a Black woman who is of Haitian descent? Well, Professor, great question. <laughs> great question. Um, okay, I'm going to tackle a couple <laughs> angles. Um, I'm going to say that, you know, this conversation around, as, so for me, when I was elected, you know, in the rep and in the Senate, it was around access, mm -hmm. right? Access and opportunity. How do we make sure that the developments that's taking place, that <clears throat> these different sectors, whether it's biotech and healthcare, mm -hmm. that, you know, we have an opportunity and businesses that are owned by people of color, black and brown, Latinx, Asian, have an opportunity to play in that field. Very, very important. So worked on a lot of legislation, right, to make sure that there's embedded systems in place um, to allow for the access and opportunity. Um, I would say that, you know, it, it was quite an amazing experience, you know, to do that work as an elected, but even before that, just working in the public sector, working in, in the city government and state government. Um, and now in my private role, um, as I'm here at Suffolk Construction and they're doing a great job building the buildings, okay? at BC, good job. I'm going to say that, you know, we continue that work, right? We have a leader um, when, when this issue, not this issue, the murder happened of George Floyd, took it seriously. You know, when some CEOs around the country were debating as they did letters to their staff and, and did a messaging, whether they should say Black community or George Floyd's name. You know, John Fish doubled down. He not only said George Floyd's name and Breonna T and other people and other names, mm -hmm. you know, he said George Floyd. He talked about the black community and he talked about the systemic racism that has impacted communities of color and black people based on our color of our skin. So there's a lot of conversation that we're having internally as to how do you turn back and really not even turn back, right? But it's, how do you provide the opportunity, mm -hmm. but real opportunity and allowing people to move forward? Mm -hmm. um, you gonna say something, Bill? That was, yeah. Uh, I would add just that uh, in, from my vantage point as Linda's spouse um, and, and watching her go into politics and seeing the decision making that, that had to go and all the calculus as a, as a young mom at the time in 20. Okay, can I jump in and say this one, please? I'm sorry, yeah. okay, because it was a lot. You gave me a lot, Dr. John Charles. I'm gonna tell you this, okay? So studies have shown you have to ask a woman at least seven times to run for office before mm. we run for office, okay? I was in the public sector. I was working mm. in government for close to nine and a half years. 
and I never thought I would run for office. Mm. Amazing, right? I never mm-hmm. thought I would run for office. But Boston is a small town, a small city, small state. Mm-hmm. And our mayor now, Mayor Walsh, was a state rep. You all know that for 17 mm-hmm. years. But Bill was the journalist at the reported newspaper. So when Speaker Tom Finneran, the Speaker of the House, decided to step down, he was no longer going to run. Marty heard about it in the House, calls Bill and says, Bill, Speaker Finneran's not going to run for office like Who's going to run? Who do you think should run? And Bill says to Marty, I think Linda should run. This is Linda's seat. And I have baby John, like 13 months old, on my hip. And Billy hangs up the phone and he turns to me. He's like, Linda, you could run for state rep. And I'm like, are you insane? Like, what are you talking about? Mind you, I work for a state rep. I was a behind the scenes person. So it took me a while to finally say you know what yeah I am gonna run I'm gonna run and we hit the streets it was a special election the best time seven hours a day campaign on doors lost 20 pounds best exercise (laughs) regime ever and it was amazing but then when the senate seat opened up and then you know that was a special election this point I have four kids I'm doing I'm we're together a long time four children I'm at the Kennedy school doing my MPA and the seat opens up you didn't have to ask me seven times because now I'm like wait that's my seat right Mm. so then we decided together and we ran go ahead honey that's great I love that story of partnership also oh thank you it's all about partnership go ahead (laughs) Uh, I mean I I I remember Linda being reluctant to do it and understandably but you know, to me, it was a natural. She had run for ward committee in Ward 17, where she had never, you know, we had just moved into that neighborhood. And in Dorchester, it's basically a Dorchester, like Lower Mills, Common Square area. And um, and she topped the ticket. Like she beat, mm-hmm. you know, all these folks who had lived there in that part of Dorchester for 20, 30, 40 years. And mm-hmm. she, so it was no surprise to me. I knew that, I, you know, you can tell how dynamic Linda is, but also she brings all, all that she, she has a whole package of uh, skill set that I thought was perfect. So it was a little awkward being the reporter at the time and we took steps at the paper to insulate me from coverage, but I was really glad she ended up doing it. Yeah, but it was not only insulate you from coverage, but they bought in an ombuds person, right? Mm. So remember the community I was representing was Dorchester, Mattapan, you know, a little bit of High Park and parts of mm-hmm. Milton, and they covered Dorchester. They have the, mm-hmm. they have that Boston Irish paper, the Dorchester Reporter, the Haitian Reporter, because when Bill joined the paper, they created the Haitian Port Reporter and also mm-hmm. the Mattapan Reporter. And mm-hmm. so people thought, oh, Linda, this is in the bag because you have the press. But no, I was so proud because Bill, they brought in an ombudsman. I tell people I didn't get enough ink and I, you know, I could have gotten more. <laughs> hey, but it was good. It was good. I'm proud. <laughs> Well, we, we are getting close here to the, uh, to the time when we're going to ask uh, people to send us uh, questions from the audience. And I want to start uh, with uh, a question from uh, Katie Dalton, who is director of the Boston College Women's Center. Okay. And Katie asks, thank you for spending time with us tonight. I'm curious what your advice is for student activists in this unique moment mm. as they turn back to campus in the fall. How can they successfully enact structural and systematic change at BC? Maybe let's start with Bill and then go to Linda. Yeah, I would, you know, for for one thing, tap into BC's alumni network, including us. I mean, there are so many people in public life here in in greater greater Boston and Massachusetts who are BC alums, who are are policymakers uh, and, and influential people and you have a connection to them through your, um, through your, your shared experience at, at Chestnut Hill. That can open doors, open them. Um, use, you know, use the power of, 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 uh, of your uh, campus experience and your connection. That's part of what brought you to Boston College probably is this amazing network. So utilize it and, um, and, and don't treat them as strangers, treat them as people that they're just they're, they're friends and allies you haven't met yet. Even if mm-hmm. even if they may not be, you may have to do some convincing, and that, you know that's the that's the power of your advocacy. But um, go after that network. That's my advice. I think I think that's a great advice, and it's not just those that are in policy, but in the public, private, right, corporate sector. 
there's so many graduates, you know, that are here and it is bringing them back on campus. Let's have conversations, let's have dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be important internally in the campus itself, right? As, as we bring professors together and we bring administration together and the students, you know, to really talk about, okay, where are we mm -hmm. moving? How are we moving in this new space? Um, and, and how we're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, I think that's important. That's wonderful. That's so good. I love that question. Thank you, Katie. Um, okay, this question is from Mary Jo Iosio, Professor of Moral Theology, and she asks, what are we, members of the BC community, administration, faculty, students, and staff, to do to expose and then reject institutionalized and unexamined white privileged and its partner, institutionalized and structural anti-black racism. Woo, Mary Jo, thank you. <laughs> it's related, right, to, to what you were saying to the students, but it seems to me that this is really a it is. systems question, yeah. It is a systems question. And so, what were you gonna say, Han? I don't know, I, I feel like, you know, you've been, you've been tackling no? okay. so much in your role. This, is a, this, this seems tailor-made for you here, Linda. <laughs> thank you. Why, thank you, Bill. No, but is it goes in the same conversation, the same answer and and conversation we just had, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's really bringing the the players and the and the folks to the table and to have a real conversation. And and that this is the piece, even as we're having this conversation around race in the whole country. I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's in companies and in its boardrooms or it's in communities, right? Or it's in your family, right? There are divisions, right? When people see George Floyd in the eight minutes and 46 seconds or, you know, folks are talking about the looting and rioting and it's like, okay, well, yes, there was no one supports that, but let's bring it back to the eight minutes and 46 seconds. Right, there were peaceful protests, and within that, there's always people that's going to want to create chaos. But so, how do you bring it back? So, to this question, Mary Jo, great question. And so, I'm going to say it's a syst is you know, so systematically, you guys are going to have to try to address this in terms of conversation, but more action, right? So, yes, we can have conversation and panels every day, all day, right? But at some point, you got to put pen to paper. And say, okay, here are some things we're really going to focus on and do. Here is, we're going to, we are going to be intentional, right, around diversity, ethnic diversity, black and brown diversity on BC's campus, whether it's students or professors and, and you know, the folks, uh, the adjunct professors, the tenured professors that we're bringing in. We're going to be intentional about that. We're going to be intentional around our administration, right? Because there's these functional departments, whether it's legal, whether it's marketing, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, it's how do you now start creating, you know, um, the idea of what is it that it, it could be. But to Mary Jo's qu question is that you have to have all the players at the table. And know this, we will not agree on everything. Okay, that just, it just doesn't happen. But if you're willing to listen, and this is so, so important, if you're willing to listen to the other side and to be able to pinpoint a place where people can have agreement and how do you expand on that, that's gonna be important moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's critical. The exposed part of, of um... Uh, Mary Jo's question, I think, is, is the key thing right now, too, is um, let's listen to what the students in particular, what their experience is, and let's let them let them get it out. I mean, we're seeing this on campuses all over the country and at high schools as well. Our, mm -hmm. our sons go to BC High. There's an Instagram page. Um, there's an Instagram um, now that, uh, that has uh, uh, Blacks at BC High and, and which Students are sharing. We already uh, very troubling incidents that have happened to them. Yeah, they don't feel we're addressed properly, or maybe didn't even get uh, reported. But that this needs to come out. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I know that the one of the state legislators, Nick uh, Senator Nick Collins, who succeeded Linda uh, in the legislature, is part of uh, you know legislation that's ongoing at, at Beacon Hill, looking at a truth and reconciliation model you know, at, at a macro level. But I think at, at institutionally, a place like BC, um, that's, that's necessary too. 
and, and it can engage mm -hmm. alumni as well. It's part of the history of what's happened, good and bad, should get uh, aired out a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's also, just for everyone listening, there's also a Black at, Black at Boston College um, that's, okay. that is yeah. being, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's, it's honestly heartbreaking to read those. <sighs> but we have to read it, and this is the thing. Mm -hmm. Like, Blacks at BC administrators, professor, you have to read it, right? Because this is the experience of someone with Black skin who come into a space where they are not the majority. And the, and the experiences are so, so important and how we're going to start mm -hmm. tackling it and looking at it differently um, mm -hmm. and really making sure that people feel like this is a place where, you know, they can be who they are. And they mm -hmm. can thrive and be smart and be engaged and be part of the BC community and any community. Um, but we have work to do, right? We have work to do, you know, all over the country. Mm -hmm. We have work to do in this state. Um, and it just continues. I have a question now from um, someone who, who put it in anonymously. But it sounds like uh, they're very familiar with some uh, the, the issues in Dorchester, maybe even a reader of the Dorchester Reporter. They say, gentrification <laughs> is a big deal in certain neighborhoods. How do you contend with the double-edged sword of increasing value in property for neighborhoods that need it and the obvious higher economic white demographic that comes with it? What part of an old Dorchester do we want to hold on to? And what parts of a new Dorchester do we embrace? Linda, I want you to start with that question because I know you worked on, on issues of housing when you were in the uh, uh, Beacon Hill. I did. Thank you, Bert. So I did. I was the chair of housing um, when I was in the Senate and I chaired it on the Senate side and then with Representative Kevin Honan, um, we did a lot around access again. How do we make sure that we're creating housing that's affordable? How do we work on the zoning laws in Massachusetts? Um, you know, a lot of people and we love everyone in Boston, right? I mean, we, we welcome people, but it's a significant number of folks that are moving into the city and I say that and and it is pushing people out right so in order to kind of tackle the issue around um, gentrification I think the the piece around creating housing that's affordable is critical right how do we make sure we continue to build housing that's affordable as you see I don't say affordable housing because mm -hmm. that it's how do you change conversations and narratives when you say affordable housing people think oh these people by those people. I'm gonna say now the 351 cities and towns because I traveled all around the Commonwealth. Um, there's a lot of books that says 10% of the housing stocks in our communities have to be affordable. Out of the 351 cities and towns, only about 90 of them are, at, mm. are, over, are over the 10%, right? And yet you have other communities that haven't touched it at all. And so it's how do we push our the larger commonwealth, you know, to do their part, right? There's legislation that the governor's pushing around the majority vote, right? In terms of these communities around housing affordability. So there's a lot of work that has to happen back to Dorchester. I'm gonna say this, right? Um, Dorchester is a community that is being gentrified, no doubt about it. If you look at the South Boston waterfront, right? A district I represented as a state senator, it's all luxury developments and luxury housing and it's moving into that community. I, I would say the way to protect it is really through home ownership right? Home ownership is critical. That's what worked for my parents when they came here and they had a two family house that allowed them to build equity. But it's going to be tough because the land that's available in the city for construction, um, a lot of it is already getting built out. And how do we make sure we can preserve more? The mayor, Sheila Dillon, they're focusing on housing affordability, um, but it's not going to be enough because again, we need these cities and towns around us to do their part as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, what parts of an old Dorchester do we hold, oh, we hold, and what parts of a new Dorchester do we embrace? And the whole issue, one of the, one of the threads throughout our years of covering Dorchester is the evolution of, of our, or we. What does that mean? And in the context of our, of our more, most recent crisis here, uh, our national crisis, but the, uh, in, in the Dorchester context, how do we uh, do? How do we decide that we want to live together? It's, it's, it's just a basic question, like that that we posed a couple of weeks ago. I posed in my editorial. Um, for those of us who've lived here for a while, the idea of living in Dorchester, it's a choice. Whether you were born here or whether you moved here, you decide at some point to stay or to go. And 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 part of the calculus is around 
obviously income and affordability, but also about the kind of neighborhood you want to live in, that you want to be in a diverse community, you want to be in a multicultural community. And that whole concept of what is we, what is, who are our kids? Are our kids the kids who look like, you know, like me in the 1980s and, and, and this, you know, in one specific sub neighborhood, or is it the whole of Dorchester? And I think that we've tried to move the needle in our careers around, you know, breaking down some of that kind of, um, that, that, that hackneyed version of what a Bostonian is. Mm -hmm. um, so I want parts of old Dorchester to fade away. Um, mm. And new Dorchester is gonna look like something uh, different because that's what happens in city neighborhoods. They're by very, their very nature, they're dy dy dynamic and always changing, always evolving, always new people, whether they're immigrants or migrants. Um, and, and we've seen Dorchester through the, through the centuries change that way from being a rural community to a Yankee vacation spot and, and stronghold to, to an Irish immigrant uh, and Jewish community. Uh, and now to what we have today through uh, black migration and Caribbean migration and Asian and Cape Verdean and the whole, you know, this whole uh, multicultural community. Um, I want that to continue. But we can't. Um, I, I don't think that you can you can mandate or or uh, create a formula to preserve any community. It's going to happen organically. But we can do the policies that Linda described to try to give checks and balances and and create affordability and to create stability for people who are feeling displaced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so this is the last question. I'm so sad because there's like four of them that would be great for you to take. Um, I also just want to amplify the voices of my students who are like sending me texts and saying that they want to make sure that you two know as alums that the Black at Boston College um, Instagram account has been censored. They're saying that all the tags have been removed. Or if, if So if you just search at Boston College, you won't find it. You have to search at Black at Boston College, sure, or fine. Black at BC. Um, so that's another thing to discuss later. Okay, last question. Um, this is from Marina Pastrana Rios, who is a 2008 alum. Um, and she's saying that, okay, so you mentioned activism and is critical to your experience at BC, foundational to your future. At the center of citizen participation in this country, is the fundamental right to participate in the democratic process, yet we are seeing the voices of Black people and people of color being silenced across the country, closing the polls, voter registration. We know all of the debacles that are happening around that. Um, what message do you have to our, for our youth and BC students specifically as the next election comes in November, and how can they participate in local activism? Question. I think increasingly there's a lot of anxiety about um, disruption this November, and not just not just because of um, um, you know any, anything related to protests or anything. We, we're, we're still going through a pandemic. We're mm -hmm. you know, Massachusetts is still um, grappling with with how to execute um, uh, remote voting in the fall in September and November. And you know, in Massachusetts, I think we'll we'll, we'll get it done. But other states. It's, it, you know, it's an open question. And uh, there's clearly um, reason to be concerned about a, a constitutional crisis here later in the year. Um, I think a lot of the activism uh, in intentional uh, organizations should start um, to, to be um, focusing on that now. Um, and students, obviously, we, we, we need their demographic. We need student uh, participation in the elections. Mm -hmm. um, Students should be getting involved. Uh, I hope they will be at the campus level. That was instructive and informative for us and in how even just retail politics worked and in the dorms and, and off campus and how to mobilize people. Uh, use that tool, learn that tool uh, by doing it. And, and then take that skill set and apply it to city elections or, or the town of Newton if you're there and, and use that local leverage, keep it local and then uh, unite with other uh, like-minded people um, across the country to apply that nationally. Absolutely. And, and just... Oh, we lost you, Linda. We lost you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Here I am. <laughs> um, I, I agree. Echo Bill 100%, but also remember to vote, right? And if you're not from Mass, 
send in your absentee ballots. But this is the piece where no doubt COVID is a, is, is, plays a role. But when you see the disenfranchisement that's happening, and the videos and the lines of people, one, one polling location for like 10,000, I mean, come on, right? This is systemic systems that, are, that this is being done purposely to suppress the vote. And so this is where a lot of mobilization is going to happen. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to have to run for office, <laughs> right, to kind of change the dynamic um, when that is taking place in 2020. Um, but we just have to be prepared for it. And for the young folks, be active, right? You all are on social media. There's a question here, which I thought was good, okay, that said that I have a junior high school student. <laughs> what can white students do, young high school white students do to help in the effort? I'm going to say, listen, be an ally right? So when you're in with your friends or you're in your communities and they may know, they may not be a person of color, mm -hmm. but if someone is popping their mouth and saying things that are like inappropriate, you need to step up, That's right. right? You need to step up and be in service to others and say, that's not going to happen in my watch, right? And, and this is the piece that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I, okay, I'll stop now. I was going to go on more, but I will end. I love that. I saw an article recently that said, you know, I don't need you to stand with me. I need you to stand where you are and do the work. That's it. Right? And that's exactly what you're describing. Thank you, Linda. That, that is it. That is the work. Well, I'm very sad to say that we are out of time. I, <laughs> okay, I want to give two, two messages to the audience uh, before I turn it over to Regine to close this out. And the first is, uh, if you are not already, I really urge you to subscribe to the Dorchester Reporter. Uh, you don't have to be from Dorchester to benefit from this newspaper. There is outstanding writing and editing. Uh, it confronts the challenges of the day. And then the last thing I will say is that I hope you will join me in my prayer. Uh, my prayer is that someone will start a draft the Linda Dorsino Fori uh, <laughs> campaign to get her into higher office. I think, Linda, what you're doing now in the corporate world is so critical. And I hope you uh, stay there as long as you want. But I miss your voice in the public square. I really do. Uh, and if you ever decide that you're going to run, I hope uh, BC alum and faculty and students and anyone else who's listening will knock on doors, uh, will carry signs, and will vote for you ultimately. And I just want to thank both so of you kind. for really uh, helping us think about these really important issues and giving us your time on a Friday night. Thank you so much, Bert. You. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to say quickly, because I've received another message about this, that I want to thank our Vice President of Student Affairs, Joy Moore, who is working to have that censorship that I mentioned before, that my students mentioned, to have it undone. Joy, we appreciate so much all the things that you've brought um, to Boston College and your work, so thank you. Um, Bill and Linda, this was so great. It was too short. Um, it has been a hard month, right? And um, I... I'm so grateful for the two of you. One of the things that I have been trying to do is find, find joy, find light, find love, um, find people that stand for justice in these times that is so encouraging, that have been so depleting. And so I'm grateful to you for the ways that you all embody joy, you embody justice, you embody light, you embody love. And I am just so inspired by you and indebted to you um, as your little Haitian sister coming along <laughs> after you. <laughs> Thank you, um, so Professor thank you, thank you, really. thank you so and much. Brett, and I, thank you. We're so grateful. This was a lot of fun. Um, and again, your generosity also. I know our students are going to be calling on you and they will continue to do so. Um, and to all of our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again next week where the topic is coming um, is athletics and the common good. Our guest is going to be Joanna Bernabe McNamee, head coach of the women's basketball team, class of 96 at Boston College, and Michael Gambino, head coach of men's baseball, and Jeffrey Halfley, Gregory Barber, uh, class of 69, and family head coach of football. You see, I'm just, you know. <laughs> and our host will be Father Jack Butler um, and Father Tony Pennon. So we um, hope that you will join us again. Um, for this conversation. To the students who are there, we love you, we miss you, can't wait to see you again, even if it's virtually. Um, and thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Merci, I'm Bill. I know. Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes. Merci, I'm Bill. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> that was good. Merci, I'm Bill. Nice. Yeah. <laughs>